Okay, let's get started. I know that uh, Professor Blocky is traveling today, so he's not able to join us today, but it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Today we have Abhishek Ray, and he's a PhD candidate in MIS at Cranert School of Management here at Purdue. And uh, his interests lie in the intersection of economics, digital business, and engineering. And he holds a master's in both economics as well as a master's in industrial engineering, both from Purdue University. So he's going to talk to us today about uh, ad blockers. So I'll just turn it over to him. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Wednesday evening, rainy as it is. Uh, this talk is about ad blockers, and seeing as, the, as it is the mid of the week, I'll keep it as light and as relatable as possible because this is quite a recent topic that we are dealing with. And being that it is a research and management science, most of the concepts here are from what the industry is trying to solve. So it should not be much of a stretch for us to understand what's going on in this world in this space of ad blockers. And to just to give you a brief overview or a brief trailer, uh, so to speak, of what should you expect from this talk, what you should leave the room with after the talk ends. First of all, our research will tell you that ad blocking is just not a temporary problem. That it's actually a symptom of the online advertising world going bad to worse. And looking at the focus of Sirius, which is information assurance and security, you as users, your privacy, your information is being traded online for millions and millions of bucks, because of which the problem of ad blockers has crept up. In fact, the movement or the trend of ad blockers has crept up because of the fact that your privacy is being prom uh, compromised by big businesses. Now, just like humans, we do. We face a problem, we have a short-term fix, we fix it, we are happy with it. But that's not the end of the story for researchers. Now, as researchers, we have to look at this and ask, is this the correct solution? Is this the correct way to go forward? Is there anything that the short-term solution has missed? So this talk will tell you what the solution has missed, what do we as researchers propose to be the optimal solution here. And if you would have uh, gone through the abstract, this uses game theory. And the reason this uses game theory is, is that data, we looked around in the industry, we talked to people, data is sensitive. Not everybody is ready to share data with us because it's your data. It's the user's data. So when there is a dearth of data, but we know that there are agents acting with selfish incentives, we turn to game theory to give us insights. Right, so a brief trailer of what you should expect, what you should leave the room with. Now let me begin with the fun part of the presentation without the math. This is a story, okay? The story begins with this gentleman who much like all of you was a graduate student in Denmark in the year 2002. He was taking an MIS course and as part of the course, his project was to develop some sort of an idea into a code, into a software uh, app. And he was looking around on the web for ideas when he bumped on the idea of how can I use or write a script to block server calls on a web page. Now those server calls could be ad server calls, those server calls could be external program server calls, but just server calls on a web page, how do I block it? So this gentleman by the name of Henrik Sorensen developed the first known version of an ad blocker. So he developed a, co a piece of software that was able to be plugged into your browser and using that when you visit a website, any server calls that goes out from the web page to any, any ad server would be blocked. He graduated, things were good, um, but little did he know that the idea that he had started with there were other people in parallel in Europe looking at the same idea and looking at how it can be monetized. In that, they were looking at ideas like ad blocking and saying, well, can't this be a business proposition or can't this be a business model? And this is where Mr. Palant comes in. He is the CEO of a company called IO GmbH, which if you would have uh, looked into the ad block plus literature, that's the company behind Adblock Plus, which is one of the largest ad blockers in the market today. And he sort of ran with the idea that Henrik had and made it monetizable, made it into a big company. And as soon as he did that, you had people like Mr. Larry Page come to his doorstep and say, hey, you're blocking my ads. Why don't I just pay you money to show my ads? So you have people like Larry Page, Jeff Bezos, and the Microsoft 
advertising networks and exchanges flocking to Mr. Palant and saying that, you know, we have a big business, you're hurting us. So why don't you take this money? We will acquiesce to your requirements. We will make ads that are non-intrusive, that don't track the users, but just don't block our ads because those are big money to us. Now this was the story till the September of 2016, September, October of 2016. But then, except the, the American election that happened in November 2016, something else happened. And this is where businesses go wrong in looking at short-term gains rather than long-term gains or the social welfare aspect of it. What happened was Adblock Plus looked at this problem and said, hey, this is an opportunity for us to scale up. Not only have a small company called Adblock Plus, but be a big giant in this field. So let me make this idea of advertisers giving us money to display their ads into a full-fledged platform. Now, when I say platform, it's basically just very, very uh, kiddishly, if I may put it, it's a two-sided market with users on one side, advertisers on the other. And Adblock Plus is like the gatekeeper on, in the middle, trying to regulate who interacts with whom, because that is basically what Adblock Plus was doing. As you would imagine, this led to collaborations between Adblock Plus and Google at the time, because remember, Larry Page was in on, in on it right from the start, and they helped Adblock Plus launch this ad exchange. Because at the end of the day, this was nothing but an ad exchange that had advertisers and users on either side. But this, again, led to a lot of backlash. So you had the industry stalwarts and the policy experts saying, this is destroying the image of ad blocking. This is not what ad blocking should be about. You have basically sold yourself to the devil. And finally, since this was just hue and cry from the industry, the profit, people followed where the money was. So you had other companies like Crystal <coughs> buying in on the idea of Adblock Plus and starting their own two-sided platform of whitelisted advertisers on one side and users on the other side. And all this, surprisingly, very, very fast-paced happened within the last one year. So as of today, if you go to the market, if you go online and you check, you have just three or four major players who have these sort of platforms. One is definitely Adblock Plus. The other is Crystal. Third is Brave, if some of you use Mozilla. Brave is also one of a similar ad blocking platform that does this. Now, from a researcher's point of view, what does this imply? What, what am I talking about? Let's, let's abstract away all this ad block plus and shine and whatever. What am I talking about? What I'm talking about is, again, like the old tested theory of technology markets, like you had initially the browser going from like a single tab browser to a multi-tab browser in IE. This is an attempt at dominant design. People want to establish that this is my business model. This is what will run in the market. Nobody else can attack it. So this was an attempt at dominant design. And what was the dominant design here? It was a gatekeeper, which had the user one entity on one side which suffers due to, ad, due to advertising because still there is tracking going on, there is intrusiveness going on, there is intrusion on your privacy going on, and you have advertisers on the other side that benefits from interaction with you. They don't have any sort of a negative benefit from your interaction. The ad blocker in, in, in the middle comes in and says, this is my value proposition to you. I provide you better ads. Come and join us. There was also this idea that maybe reducing intrusiveness actually maybe implies that it improves user experience. There's a lot of debate on that, that maybe just reducing intrusiveness does not mean that your experience is improved. Maybe if you have dumb ads coming in which are not relevant, they are non-intrusive, but they doesn't serve anything to improve the user experience. And finally, this sort of a value proposition was being advertised by all the ad block plus and the users, et cetera, that good advertisers equals good ads, equals users' privacy uncompromised, right? So this, this was what you would get out of these conferences with these big technology giants. But what was the perception? If you would have listened to, if you would have uh, seen Silicon Valley episodes, there was a pivot going on. So Adblock Plus was pivoting from just a plugin to a platform, which had Adblock users on one side, which had pre-approved advertisers on the other side, or the whitelisted advertisers. They used to charge the advertisers for whitelisting the ads, but not so much the users. And this is where I mentioned in the, final, in, the, in the initial trailer of my talk, is that, is this the right thing to do? Should you as users, 
who are anyway being exposed to ads, should you be allowed to use this for free? Should you be charged for it? Or should you be paid for it? Now, before going into what our results highlight, which is in itself a sort of a unique result, let me tell you why am I going into this? Why are the team of researchers in Cranard looking at this? So in order to impress upon you that, let's see first example, what is a traditional ad exchange? And how is this different from a traditional ad exchange? Traditional ad exchange, as I explained, is just an ad exchange with users and advertisers on either side, right? And so that's, uh, it's, I've explained this again and again, so I won't dwell much on it. Let me go to what an ad blocker platform exchange looks in conjunction with an advertising exchange. So an ad blocker platform, let's for, for example assume that all of you are ad block users, and this is the ad blocker platform. So you would be the A here, or the users, who are using the ad blocker platform, and the W are the advertisers who whitelist on this ad blocker platform to show ads to you. At the same time, you have the people outside this room. In our, in our toy example, let's assume that people outside the room don't use Adblock Plus. They are the NA, and you have the non-whitelisted advertisers who don't choose to whitelist. And they obviously interact through the traditional ad exchange, because you still have websites you visit without having an ad blocker. But here is where the curious thing happens, is that these whitelisted advertisers are also able to target you. And so therefore, it's like a win-win for them, that if I pay one fee, I get access to all the parties in this club. So the whitelisted advertisers are basically winning at this, right? And this is, sort of, this is the sort of interaction which worries business leaders, as well as worries economists and policy experts, is that is this sort of an interaction Given this sort of interaction, is the ad blocker doing the right thing by allowing access to you for free, or should they monetize you, or should they pay you? Now, what changes in the ad blocker platform apart from the structure that I just mentioned? So apart from the structure, if you would have thought about it, there are a few things that are changing here from a traditional ad exchange. In a traditional ad exchange, you, the user, has no control over what ads are shown to you, right? You go onto a normal website, you have no control over what ads will be shown to you, and therefore the danger of privacy, intrusion, et cetera. In the ad blocker platform, you do have a control. So if you use any, any ad blocker, you can report an ad, you can block an ad, you can see if the ad is coming from the right domain and block that domain. In other words, you have control. Now the user has control given the ad blocker platform. Now, given control, what else is new in this? What, what, what am I talking about which is not there in a traditional ad exchange? Participation in a traditional ad exchange is individually rational, which means you would rather visit a website than not visit it, right, to consume your news. You visit Forbes, you visit any other website, you would rather visit it. Advertiser, too, would rather advertise than not advertise, right? So it's, in, so it's individually rational for them, not so much on the ad blocker platform. Because if the whitelisting fee increases, or if the number of ads using an ad blocker increases, you would, at that moment, uninstall it. You'd be fed up with it. I don't want this. So there is a non-individual rationality to the ad blocker platform, which is what we term as, in economics, as an outside option. That if I come onto this platform, or if I come into this market and try to uh, have an exchange or have an interaction, I always have an outside option of not interacting with you. Finally, like the structure mentions, the participants on this platform also impact the non-participants, which means the whitelisted advertisers, who are the participants on the ad blocker platform, impact the non-participants, which are the non-adopters, the people outside the room. Now, this is the big picture that we went in with because there is already a Nobel Prize winning literature on the fact of two-sided platforms. So if you look at any sort of a business, there are criteria to term it as a two-sided platform, which is the 2003 Nobel Prize by Roche and Tirol. Now, this literature is sorely lacking in these aspects. It does not mention that if people have control, what happens? It doesn't mention if that is not individually rational, or in other words, if participants have an outside option, how, do it, how does a two-sided platform price its participants? And finally, what is the effect of a participant on a non-participant? And if that effect exists, how do two-sided platform price the participation? 
So this literature is actually sorely lacking in these aspects, and our research sort of adds to this part, to that body of literature. So how do we add it? What is the research question? What are we trying to investigate? First, what does the outside option mean for the pricing of such a platform? How do non-participants impact an ad blocker platform? And finally, how does this structure of the ad blocker impact the websites and the content providers, which actually is the most relevant question if you look at the industry they want to know. Because the first two is from an academic point of view, gold mine for us. Like We really like analyzing this, but if I have to go and talk in a tech conference, I have to basically dwell on this and convince them that this is a solution that may work well for them. So fundamentally, as I said, how does two-sided platform theory change in the light of ad blocker exchanges? And relatedly, now this is where the serious part of my talk comes in. There is a need to relook online advertising. Now, just like if you don't uh, eat well, or if you don't keep healthy, you have symptoms that your body gives you of your body not being healthy. Ad blocker, or the surge in the adoption of ad blocker, is a symptom of the fact that online advertising is failing. And when we take it as a symptom, we have to relook at the core problem, which is online advertising itself. So what can we talk about in this space as to why do we need to relook online advertising? It's because users have the intrusion. Like I said again and again, they have an intrusion from ads online. You are being tracked whether you like it or not. So in that aspect, how does one relook at on an online advertising? For any ad-supported platform, now this is a question that has come up recently with the fear of free internet dissipating. People have debated that you should not have free internet. They have debated you should have free internet. In that light, for any ad-supported platform which gives you content for free, what does the optimal price, pricing policy of such platforms imply? Which means, at the end of the day, can our research say anything about should you be given content for free consumption or should you be charged to consume content? Uh, consume content? And finally, with mobile apps, like most of us now consume content on our mobile phones. It's neither desktop or nor laptop. So most of the traffic that comes to social media websites, et cetera, comes through apps. Given the apps, what's the optimal policy? So given our first primary research questions, we build on top of that to answer the related questions in terms of what should be a change in this space. And why is this research important? Why am I talking about this on a Wednesday evening, which is so rainy? Is because this has started happening. So Silicon Valley, as always, is the first in the game. They have started developing companies which pay you to watch ads. But at the end of the day, when Google and Microsoft and Amazon look at this, they don't want their market encroached. So this also has started happening, that either watch, pay, or go away. So in fact, I was reading today itself that Google, your Chrome browser that you use without thinking, there is a plan to introduce an inbuilt ad blocker in that, which means Google will also become an ad blocker platform. And then what they will do is they will force publishers to charge you to consume content. So if you have the ad blocker app option on on your Chrome and you visit a website, they'll ask you to pay to read an article on Forbes. They'll ask you to pay to read an article on Wired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if that was to happen, which by what the news says may happen by the end of this year or early next year, our research can go and sort of put a block in it, say, wait, just hold on for a second. That may not be the optimal pricing policy. Again, if you look at the mobile space, brands are taking a leaf out of Ad Wallet's book and saying that, well, if you are on our app and consuming content, we'll reward you for consuming content by not skipping. But again, want a better web? Here's an idea, pay for it. And finally, which is the most disturbing of it, is that there are reports out there which says that giants like Facebook are saying that maybe ad-supported content may not be sustainable, especially in the developing world. So you might have a, have a situation where the developed countries have free internet and the developing countries have pay internet. So does that really make sense? So on a larger scale, our research intends to, uh, intends to impact this space also. So with all that talk that I gave, do I have the money to show for it, right? So what are the big picture results? First and foremost, our game theoretic model brings forward a way of thinking about monetizing user attention. 
aka the attention economy, right? So people write about it, people publish books over it, but is there a way to mathematically capture what, the, what is the way to monetize user attention? So that's the first contribution. The second contribution is, since users choose to participate, there is a case to be made to reward users for participating. So there is a case to be made that you should be actually paid to watch ads in general. Doesn't matter if it's ad wallet, doesn't matter if it's brave. Third, the advertiser participation, as I said, has no negative externality. So charging them is the optimal policy, and there is no two ways about it. And finally, and this is where, again, as I said, the, in the industry conferences sort of look more at that, is that the content provider or the websites that you visit, they have an incentive to play foul, which means given that your privacy is safe, given that advertisers are being charged, let me set the quality of content low so that you still come to my website because you're seeing less ads, but I just have lesser costs of maintaining the website. Right? So this part of the research actually tends to talk to that audience and say that, well, this may be some incentive that you might have which you might relook at. So there should be regulation concerning this. Now, with all that, let me dive into the model, into the basic model of what we are trying to do here. Now, in any sort of a game theoretic model, there is abstraction. So you will not see a lot of the prime nouns here of Adblock Plus and Brave and et cetera. There is an abstraction in the level that it's more, yes. I do have one question regarding the content providers. Isn't there in the background also the need for them to increase their revenue so that they can go back to some of the journalistic higher standards that they had before they mm -hmm. were just under pressure to provide clicks yes. on the internet? And are you, are you factoring that into your model? Uh, we are not factoring that particularly into our model, but we are factoring the costs of producing a content, uh, of producing content, and therefore there is an argument in our model that if the costs increase, then they would find it better to set a lesser quality. So it goes back to your question about is that being addressed? Directly, no, but indirectly through the costs we do address it. Any other questions? Okay. So it's a two-stage perfect information game. So in game theoretic terms, it's like a world where there are two periods in which the world functions. The first period is when the ad blocker sets prices. There is just one ad blocker, and the content provider sets content quality, and it's a simultaneous move game. So in, 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 in basic game theory terms, the content provider has no idea what the ad blocker is setting a price as. The ad, block, the ad blocker has no idea what the optimal content quality is set by the content provider. They just have a simultaneous move game in which they move, which if I were to stretch it a bit, is much like what happens in the real world. So a website doesn't have an idea what the ad blocker is doing. The ad blocker doesn't have an idea what the website is doing. The stage two, in fact, there are, there are agents like users and advertisers who have an idea what is being done. So given the ad blocker exchange prices and given the content quality set, the users and advertisers opt to join in or not join into the ad blocker. Because remember, there's always an outside option. In order to make our uh, model robust from a game theory point of view, we don't consider just homogeneous advertisers and users, no. There are heterogeneous users, heterogeneous advertisers. So when I say heterogeneous users, they are basically in terms of their usage activity. How much do they use the internet? Differentiated on that basis. For advertisers, it's what is their advertising size campaign? So from the lowest to the highest, we look at all sorts of advertisers that are out there. And finally, there's just one ad blocker and one content provider. Now, a slide with some equations, but fear not, I'll go into more details of each of these users later on. But just to give you a high level view, as I said, there are two types of agents on either side, users and advertisers. And they are differentiated into two things, adopters, non-adopters for users, whitelisters, non-whitelisters for advertisers. The ad blocker has a simple objective function they're trying to utilize here. Just, objectively, just maximize their profit function. And finally, the content provider, as I said, they have a cost to their content, and at the same time, they have some sort of a revenue from their content, or payoff from their content, and a revenue from whitelisted and non-whitelisted advertisers. The NA, if you would have noticed here, is the mass of users who are choosing to opt into the ad blocker, and MW is basically the mass of whitelisters who are opting to whitelist their ads. So, Let's go into the user model. The first thing that you would notice here is there are 
payoffs from interacting with users. So the first type of payoff that agents like users have in this is from interacting with advertisers. Where does the story about uh, intrusion and privacy come in? So if you see the C terms here, the C and the C, this is basically the marginal disutility you have from intrusion or from violation of your privacy or from tracking or from setting your cookies, etc. So this is the term that sort of measure, measures that disutility you have. But at the end of the day, you are receiving some utility from advertising. So we cannot rule that out. Because if, if there is just disutility and no utility, you would never come, right? So this is actually the payoff from advertising, which is HA, which is as an adopter, when you opt into the ad blocker platform, you have some payoff from benefiting from the advertisers. And HNA is the benefit you receive from not adopting. Now, KC, as I said, is the content quality or the benefit you receive from the content quality. And at the end of the day, what we are trying to solve here is what should an ad blocker do? How should it charge participation? So the price PA that you notice here is the fixed charge of participation of an ad blocker. Now, this is a point that has been raised by academic reviewers time and again, where they have, said, where they have basically said that why do you consider a fixed charge? What's the reason you consider a fixed charge? Why not a variable charge based on the amount of usage, right? Our idea is basically this. Most of the activity dependent pricing is already established. So you go onto your apps, you go onto your websites, the more you use it, there are certain rewards to you, right? So that's already done. We don't want to attack that space at all. What we want to do is fixed price actually di dictates individual rationality more strongly than transactional based price. So if we are able to prove that the fixed price also varies given the curious nature of interactions here, we can basically prove that this is our optimal policy. Because it's very easy to, sh to tell you that because you use it more, you might be incentivized to use it more by paying you money, right? That's pretty natural, that's obvious. But if we are able to show that even the fixed price follows a similar nature, that might be a stronger proof of the fact that this is the optimal policy. And finally, this is a practical implication. People have started attacking your fixed cost. So if you use Adblock Plus, you go on to Forbes, there's a direct message saying, we detect an ad block on your browser, please turn it off. You won't be able to consume content without it. So they have started attack attacking your fixed cost, not your variable cost. There is nowhere they say that, okay, consume just 12 articles, and maybe after that you can turn off your ad blocker. Nothing like that. So this, in fact, sort of led us to the path with which, which we basically said that if you're able to prove that the fixed price follows a dual nature, maybe we can show that this is a stronger pricing policy. Now, given that, let's see what the advertiser is doing here. Simple model again. Two types of advertisers, whitelisted and non-whitelisted. There are fixed benefits from whitelisting, obviously, or from advertising, which is based on your ad format, the type of uh, ad slots you get on a website, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> the whitelisted ads are less intrusive, and so their fixed benefits are higher. And the non-whitelisted ads are more intrusive, so their fixed benefits are lower. But again, fixed benefits might be there, but there are benefits from interaction or transactional benefits. So the transactional benefits are the next terms that come into picture. And these are the benefits that they get from you maybe clicking on an ad and converting a sale later in the future, or maybe clicking on the ad, going to the website, looking around and buying something else. So those sort of transactional benefits are actually captured through these terms. And these are marginal returns per user. So again, following the same format that SW and SNW have, RW and RNW are in the same way. RW is greater than RNW, or in other words, transactional benefits from whitelisting are higher than transactional benefits from non-whitelisting. And finally, much like the reality now, the PW that is there is the fixed price of whitelisting, which, again, that is an attackable assumption, which we have data on in the sense that we have interview excerpts from the companies we talk to, most of the companies pay a, pay a fixed price. It's like a licensing fee, that if my ads are licensed with you, you can show my ads to your ad block users. So in that sense, this is a fixed fee. Now, this is the most interesting part, and this is what I said, is we provide a way of thinking about user monetization. 
This is what we get as the optimal price that they should charge you, you being the adopters or PA star. Now, if you notice here, there is one term here that does not appear to belong to a whitelisted or an adopted population. So there are actually two terms. The first term is this RNW, which is the revenue from non-whitelisted advertisers. And the second is this HNA, which is the benefit as a non-adopter that you receive. Now, given these two sort of terms, what can we say about the price of, white of, price of adoption? The PSR is positive. It's plain and simple, vanilla positive. When you have no whitelisters, so therefore you don't see any ads if you use the ad blocker, and you have the revenue that the non-whitelister receives from interacting with you as a non-adopter lesser than a certain value. Now, the interesting case is when is PA star negative? When should they pay you? And this is where it gets really interesting. When we have MW star between 0 and 1, in the sense that if I have a fraction of my advertiser population whitelisted, and I have the fact that the revenue that an advertiser as a non-whitelisted entity earns from you greater than a threshold value, it is then that the ad blocker should optimally incentivize you to come onto the platform. This actually has evidence, however small or new it may be. We discovered the evidence. We initially thought this was a cool mathematical result. We were very excited about it. But at the end of the day, there is practical implications and evidence of it developing in the industry. So just going back to the big picture, what's happening here? Again, the same diagram, the same uh, setup, the ad exchange, you as the adopter, other people as the non-adopters, whitelisted, non-whitelisted. It is because of this term that the ad blocker is getting affected, which is what we initially theorized. We said that there should be some sort of an effect of the non-adopters or the non-whitelisters on the participants because of this guy getting to interact with both participants and non-participants. And this is what we see in this model, is that this sort of a revenue, if the advertiser earns more from you being a non-adopter, the ad blocker should incentivize you to come onto the platform. And that, irrespective of the fact that it's transactional or fixed, it's a fixed result, and it varies given the population of adopters and non-adopters. Now, you may say that's very well and good. Does this apply generally? And this is where we go to the big picture impacts of what we are doing. So in the economics literature, there have been attempts at solving the online advertising problem. Or in other words, a problem where one set of agents interacting with you have always positive benefits, and you as the other agent has a negative benefit from interacting with that agent. So we actually take that model, extend it to our case, and see that the users opting to act on these platforms, et cetera, any two-sided platforms, anyone, be it a platform, be it an app, be it a website, the advertiser should pay the users if the demand elasticity is high. Which means if there is a website like Facebook for which the demand elasticity is very high, in the sense that if the access to it is broken one day and you are flustered, they should actually pay users to come onto the platform. And secondly, the social welfare optimizing price. Now, social welfare is a beaten term in the sense that people have different interpretations of social welfare. In our case, it's just simple. Your utility as a user should be maximized. In that case, the prices have to be unambiguously negative, which means they should pay you regardless of what they are doing with the other side. This, we have an academic contribution to the literature, etc. But let me go on to what are the evidence for these results. How can I stand here today and tell you that this is optimal? First, remember I talked about Brave Browser. Because of Bitcoin and digital token currency getting more and more popular. Mozilla's co-founder, who is the, the, the founder of the Brave Browser, has started doing this. It has started rewarding you Bitcoin to see safe ads. Now, whether this is fixed or transactional doesn't matter. Because what they're trying to do is, for whatever amount of time there is that you are a Brave user, you will be assured Bitcoins. The amount doesn't matter. How, how much number of time you use a website doesn't matter. You will be rewarded Bitcoins. And finally, 
Microsoft has jumped into this. There is something called a Microsoft Rewards program where they're trying to lure the user away from Chrome and say that, hey, if you use Bing, we'll reward you. So what does this all imply at the end of the day? What does this imply from a takeaway point of view? From If you leave this room right now, what should you remember? Three things. Ad blocker platforms are just the symptoms. The cure lies in the rethink of online advertising. And finally, attention needs monetization, but the hunt for attention does not. Thanks. <laughs>